done. Okay. All right, tonight we're going to talk about some stuff, some defenses to negligence, and then we're going to talk about some uh, premise liability stuff. But, you know, this is now, we've been talking about, you know, the plaintiff so much. You know, we did the petition, so we we're on the plaintiff side. Uh, you know, what can the plaintiff sue for, and what's their causes of action, and blah, 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 and blah, 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 and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. Now let's look at, hey, what is if you're on the defense side? You know, what do you do? You know, what's your what's your defense is now to kind of throw the plaintiff off their game or so that they don't recover anything or what they recover is less? You know, because that's your job if you're working for a defense firm, okay? You know, I always thought about it and was told, and, and this is absolutely true, uh, on the plaintiff side, you have to build the house brick by brick to prove your case. Defense side, all you have to do is knock some of those bricks out. Okay? Is it easier? Can be. But if the plaintiff's got just a superb case with real no holes in it, man, hang on because you're going to pay some money. And those, of course, are the cases that need to be settled. As a good defense attorney, um, even though you'd be the paralegal on the side, good defense attorney should recognize that. Say, man, this is just a good case. I mean, they're going to eat our lunch. And that's where they got to just talk to their client and say, this is a case you need to settle. Sometimes the clients will be stubborn and say, no, we're not settling, we're trying this case. Okay. That's where the defense attorney writes them a letter and says, you know, my suggestion and, and recommendation is to settle, but you want to try it? I just want to know that, you know, you're opening yourself up to liability. It's a CYA letter, of course. And you try it, you win, you're a hero, you lose. I hate to say it, but it's a, I told you so. Okay. And no, no case is a lock. I mean, no case is a 100% win, no matter how solid it looks. I agree with that. But, you know, you've got to play the odds. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's kind of like baseball. I don't know if any of you have been watching the baseball this last year, and in particular the series that's going on um, right now. If you notice that a lot of the infielders are shifting over, you'll see three guys in the infield on one side, of second base, and there's one guy on the other side of second base. That's never been the way they've played the game. But what they've learned is they got to play the odds. And the odds of that person hitting to the left side is less for this, you know, hitter and pitcher against them. So they play the odds. No difference in, in trial. You've got to play the odds. And if the odds are stacked against you, you try to settle the case. You, know, you look at your case, look at, you know, what the plaintiff side is, look at what the defenses are against it. And, you know, because like I've always said, too, if we knew what juries were going to award every time, we'd never try a case. So anybody says, oh, I know what the jury's going to do. Really? Then why do you ever try cases? Because you would know exactly what the amount is, and that's the amount you'd try to settle for, flat out. Not a dollar more, not a dollar less. Nobody knows. Okay? We have an idea, you know, but there's a point where you – Take that risk, and it's point you don't. It's playing the odds at that time. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's see what the defenses are. The objectives of this file. Oop, sorry. Understand the defense of contributory negligence, the concept of less clear chance, comparative negligence, and assumption of risk. Okay. We, we know that the plaintiff has the burden of proof by a preponderance of the evidence, okay? The, we talked about this as a duty, breach of that duty, the causation and damages. I mean, it's as simple as that, and we've talked about that. However, the defendant can escape this liability by offering a defense that diminishes or prevents recovery. That's why I said whole or in part. Hey, anything you can knock off the best, the better, Okay. If the plaintiff contributes to the eventual injury, guess what? They don't get as much. That's simple. As long as you can convince the jury of that. If they, in the state of Texas at least, and, and I think a lot of states, most states, if the plaintiff is more than 50%, guess what? They don't get anything. It wipes out their entire claim. All right. Contributory negligence, we've talked a little bit about this, but let's 
talk a little more. Plaintiff's conduct may provide a partial or complete defense. It fails to protect herself or himself. If plaintiff falls below the standard to which he should conform for his own protection, plaintiff may have contributed to protection harm brought about by the defendant's negligence. Makes sense, right? If you don't protect yourself, you don't do something, then you could be contrived. You know, if you see a car coming out of control all the way down the highway, and you're looking at it, and you've got, you know, half a mile, and you see it in your lane, and you're like, well, screw that. He's got to get out of my lane. You know, if not, he's going to run into me. I'm going to sue the crap out of him. Really? That's what a reasonable, normal person would do? No. Okay? normal person may pull off the roadway or do something, take some evasive action. Okay? Plaintiff's contributory negligence may act as a companion to the action by the plaintiff. Ends the plaintiff's claim. Totally. Not truly negligence, more accurately, it was contributory fault. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever you want to call it. Okay? And I think it's pretty easy to understand this. I mean, this came from common law, of course, you know, case law and everything. You just, yeah, somebody can't, you know, that owes a duty to you, can't breach that duty and hurt you. I agree. Everybody agrees. However, you can't sit there and do nothing. Or, worse yet, maybe you were at fault. And you contributed to the accident or the injuries or whatever. Okay. Right. Impact on proving proximate cause. Under contributory negligence, plaintiff's conduct, no matter how slight, that contributed to proximately causing the injury would bar plaintiff's con for claim for recovery. Okay? Courts might avoid applying this doctrine strictly by that the plaintiff's contributory negligence had to be a substantial factor in causing the injury. Yeah. It, it's state of Texas doesn't necessarily go by that. They go by the contributory negligence. I mean, it depends what the proximate cause is, but there again, it's all rolled into one. Okay, some some may separate it out. Avoidable consequences: plaintiff must take proper care to protect his or her own interest. Is closely related to the issue of contrib because damages could have been avoided. Plaintiff had just engaged in reasonable conduct. That's absolutely true. These are all the same things. If you start looking at it, it's all the same. I mean, if you did something to contributory to be contributory negligent or to cause your injuries, okay? Maybe you're riding in the back of a pickup truck, yelling, screaming, woo, and all of a sudden somebody gets in an accident with you, okay? You get thrown out of the truck. Hmm. Hmm. You know, did you approximately cause some of your injuries? Possibly. Because if you would have been inside the cab, your injuries wouldn't have been that bad. And you know, you're doing something you weren't supposed to be doing. Okay? All right. Comparative, just basically, we're going we're gonna to talk about comparative and true contributory and all that in a little bit. But comparative negligence shifts the focus from uh, basically division of damage between those at fault. Many states have replaced the contributory negligence defense with comparative, which is what Texas is, and a lot of the states are. Basically, it apportions the damages, where true contrib means it doesn't matter. If you're 90%, you still get 10% in damages. That's not the norm in most states and not in the state of Texas. It's comparative. You get up to a certain amount, and after that amount, 50%, you don't get anything. Okay? All right. A plaintiff who contributed to the negligence would and could recover offset by a degree of plaintiff's contributory negligence on the accident. Under contrib, Plaintiff can get no recovery if plaintiff only contributed by a certain percent, or by 50%, sorry. I can't read that over there. I assume that's what that says. Okay. 
right. It, it, like I said, it all comes down to that. If you're if you're out there and you're doing something and you contribute, you know, whatever it may be, to the accident itself, to the injuries, there's going to be a philosophy that you're only going to get a percentage, and that's going to go to the jury. Okay. So this is why when you when you this is why it's so important. If you're on the defense side, if you talk to the defendant and or in the accident report, there's something in there that says something. Like maybe your guy, you know, did something. Maybe he I don't know failed to stop at a stop sign or something. But all of a sudden, in the report, the police officer talks about skid marks from the other car, who's a plaintiff now. And it's like, you know, 100 feet long, so they must have been going 100 miles an hour. Wow. That is contributory negligence. And as such, their percentage will be submitted to the jury. Okay? Because it comes down to the old saying, two wrongs don't make a right. And you shouldn't be able to basically recover for something you helped cause. Makes sense. This goes back to, like I said, old common law and stuff that, you know, if, if you do something against your neighbor, you should be held responsible. Well, if you do something to contribute to your own damages or your injuries or whatever, you shouldn't, you shouldn't recover. And the amount most you should be able to recover is the other person's percentage. Okay. All right. Negligence by the defendant causing harm or injury to the plaintiff. Negligence by the plaintiff that contributed to his or her injuries. A measurement of the percentage of the relative contrib, okay, both plaintiff and defendant. If there's one plaintiff and one defendant, or if there's multiple, it's got to add up to 100%. Okay? Think about it. Those two people, if those are the only two people that are said to have caused this accident, then their negligence has to equal 100%. Now, there's some strategy here. This is what you learn for doing law for a while. All of a sudden you're thinking, you know, that plaintiff sure did a lot of damage. You know, they really, they were contributory negligent big time in this accident. But there's another defendant out there that I could bring in. Okay, let's think about this for a minute. I don't think I'm that liable. This other defendant I think is more liable than me, but I think the plaintiff is really liable. Okay. Now, what am I getting at? The plaintiff has sued me, has not sued the other defendant. Should I bring that other defendant in? Why or why not? Just smart char. It's not necessarily a right or wrong answer, but I think there's a better answer. Because I've had this situation come up a number of times in my practice. Okay, so you think, Lisa, you think I should bring him in as a responsible third party? I can. I can bring him in. There's no doubt. I can bring them in, but do I want to? Like I said, I think the plaintiff is a lot of this case at fault. I'll give you a little more hint. Definitely more than me. All right, Brenda, what do you got? We would want to bring them in because then they would be more financially responsible than I would. Okay. All right. Here's what I would do, and I have done. I didn't bring them in. I didn't bring them in. And eventually, the statute of limitations runs, and nobody can bring them in. I can't bring them in, and the plaintiff can't bring them in. Okay? We go to mediation. 
and I show how bad the plaintiff contributed to this, and I show there's only going to be two people listed on that jury sheet, and I show that they're more responsible than me. What does that mean? Because remember, it's got to equal 100. That means that they're more than 50%. If they're more than 50%, how much do they get? State of Texas. Zero. If I bring in that other party, there's a real good chance that the jury is going to split that up. They're not going to hit the plane of 50 over 50%. They might hit the other defendant, you know, 30, 40%. They'll hit me 20, 30%. And they'll hit the plaintiff, you know, another 40%. Well, that helps the plaintiff in a way because they get 60% recovery. My way, they get zero. But you have to make sure the client knows this. There's a risk. Because if they do hit you, then you're, you're going to be held responsible. But if it's really one-sided, the plaintiff really is liable. Then why do I want to bring in more parties to spread that liability? I want as much on that plaintiff as possible. Because all I need is 51%. And if I was only 10 or 20% max, it means they're probably going to get hit 80 or 90%. And at worst, I would hope 51, 60%. And that's how I'd argue to the jury. I'd say, hey, Listen, whatever happened here, it is clear that the plaintiff was definitely more at fault than me. I'm not saying we weren't 10%, 15% at fault, but it's clear they were more responsible than me. And guess what? They go back in the jury room and say, well, that guy, he's probably one-sided, but we do agree that the plaintiff's more at fault. So let's hit it 55-45. Okay. They don't know what I'm doing, and they don't know the result of their answer. So they go in, and they put 55 on the plaintiff and 45 on me. I win. I win all day long on that. Because I already put in their minds that I'll accept some responsibility, and they're going to say, well, he's being just one-sided. We think his client's more liable. But they will go, oh, we'll agree with them because I want to split the baby. We'll, we'll agree with them that the plaintiff is more responsible. Okay, that's all I care about. And that's how you can win those cases. Okay. Now, you got to make sure, like I said, that your client does that. Now, this is something that, you know, the attorney always has to make the decision on with the client, not you. But as you can see, there's some strategy involved in this, in using this comparative negligence. Okay. All right. Forms of comparative negligence. States could use three forms of comparative negligence versions. Uh, variations exist, and paralegal students, such as you all, should, of course, know your local statutes to determine the exact nature of the state in your system. Okay? And that's why I've said, you know, state of Texas, I can tell you. I can tell you most states follow this, but not all. Some follow what they call pure comparative. This is the award to the plaintiff is the degree that the plaintiff's own negligence caused the injury. Parker suffers 20,000 damages, where he's 25% liable and defendant is 75%. So Parker only recovers 15,000. I'm sorry, 150,000, sorry. No, it should be, 50, sorry, 15,000. My eyes are reading wrong. Okay? You understand that? Even though, okay, he recovers the 15,000 because it's 25 and defends 25%. Okay. Let's go to the next one. Modified comparative. Plaintiff can recover. I don't know why I can't read this. Hold on. Let me see if I can shrink this somehow to read it. The plaintiff's own negligence does not exceed 49%. Okay. If it does, plaintiff gets nothing. Otherwise, damage award is offset by the degree of plaintiff's own negligence. Okay. 
slight growth system, plaintiff can recover so long as the plaintiff's own negligence was minor, such as 10%. If it does, then plaintiff gets basically the percentage that they're awarded. So this is where, you know, if it's an 80-20, then the plaintiff would still get, even though the plaintiff's 80%, they would get 20%. Okay. States, I think most states have gotten away from that. Okay. Most states have gotten away from that. Basically, I told the state of Texas, use comparative negligence where if you're over 50%, you don't recover anything. And basically, some use the modified that if it doesn't exceed 49%. So if you're 50-50, you lose. State of Texas is 51. If you're even, you're even. Okay. All right. Joint tort feasors. We talked about this when more than one defendant. Okay. An acting system of comparative negligence have maintained the common law rule of joint and several liability. Plaintiff is entitled to recover whatever judgment may be awarded from any defendant found to be liable. Remember, if the defendant is more than 50%, say 60, and the other defendant is 40, the 60% defendant can be forced to pay the whole judgment. Or the plaintiff can elect to collect 60 from one and 40 from the other. The 40% person would only be liable for the 40%, where the 60% would be liable for the 60 and 100%. Now, that does not mean that the 60% liable defendant cannot go after the 40% defendant for their contrib. So if the, per, the defendant that's 60% liable pays the whole judgment, they can go after the joint tort fees or 40% for their 40% back. But they may be judgment-proof. They may not have anything. So that's why the plaintiff wants 100% from the 60%. Does that make sense? Sounded good in my head, but I don't know if... I relate it to you all. You understand that? I know I explained it like a week ago, but... Okay. All right. Like I said, it sounded great coming out of my mouth, but don't know all the time if it comes out and sounds as good as it sounds. Okay. Assumption of risk. I will tell you the state of Texas, this is comparative negligence. They don't really look at assumption of risk. Some states do. It's there. Okay? But basically, the state of Texas just uses the comparative negligence standard. All right. When a plaintiff knowingly puts himself or herself to danger and assumes excuse me, responsibility for any harm, then defendant can escape liability. It's no different than I told you, the guy in the back of the truck jumping up and down, going the highway, you know, 70 miles an hour, and a car hits him. You assume that risk, okay? Another word is you contributed your, your negligence, not being reasonable, contributed to, the, to your injuries. Same thing. That's the way the state of Texas looks at it. Some jurisdictions, a little bit different, assumption of risk, okay? Individuals responsible for the consequences, such as when the plaintiff engages in, you know, rock climbing or bungee cord jumping or whatever. Okay? That's why you sign waivers. And you also have to remember, just because, you know, like if you play a sport and you get hurt in a sport, football, baseball, or whatever, you still have to prove that the player that hit you was negligent. They didn't do what a reasonable football player would do. This is why you're seeing hockey's a good example, okay? Those guys get beat the tar out of each other, okay? And they're out there. However, there's no doubt, now I don't know what's in their contract that stops them from maybe suing each other, but there are times when there have been lawsuits out of that. Like if some a hockey player takes a stick and hits somebody in the eye and takes out his eye, seen a case on that. The other hockey ruined his career, ruined his hockey career. Sued that player. You're not assuming that risk. 
Okay? That's not something in normal play of hockey. Okay? Checking, you know, slamming them into the boards, doing all that. Hey, you get hurt, that's tough cookies. But when somebody takes out a stick and swipes you in the head with it, it's actually assault. And actually, I think even in there, there they did press criminal charges. Okay? All right. Two elements of assumption of risk. Voluntary assumption of known risk by the plaintiff and full knowledge of the danger inherent in the risk. Okay? This is why the, the helmet situation for the concussion syndrome that the NFL players are suing on is somewhat holding water. They knew the risk, okay? But they didn't know the full knowledge of the danger inherent in the risk, and that would be Numerous, they knew they were taking hits every game, but they didn't know the end result would end up in that many concussions and that many brain damage, or that much brain damage to them. That's where they're getting around the assumption of the risk. Yeah, we knew we'd get hit in the head. We knew it would hurt. But we didn't know this was long term and we weren't able to talk when we were 50 years old. Okay. It's like smoking cigarettes, same thing. Oh, well, they smoke, that's their problem. You know, a lot of people feel that way. You know, you smoke a cigarette, you get cancer, what did you think it was going to do? The problem with that was the tobacco companies were putting the nicotine in there at such high concentrations that it was making it more addictive to smoke more. Okay? So... You know, there's some other, there's some problems there. All right. Different from contrib, assumption involves knowingly accepting the danger and the voluntary assenting to exposure while contrib is a departure from the standard of care to an ordinary reasonable person. Yeah. Assumption of risk involves choosing to go skydiving while contributor and negligence involves a failure to check the parachute is properly packed. Well, that's right. That's right. But you still have to prove that the person that dropped you out of the plane is negligent to sue them. Let's take assumption of risk out of it. You jump out of a plane, okay? If the people that own the plane did not pack your chute right, okay? They didn't pack it right. I agree. Assumption of the risk, you bet. doesn't apply because negligence is there. We well, use them the risk to jump out of the plane. Now with a chute that you packed wrong, who who assumes that? Now, let's see. Give me a give me a give me a parachute that's not packed right because I want to go jump out of a plane with it. Really? You assume that risk? Are you nut? Okay, think about it. Well, what happens if everything was done right? You've jumped out of a plane 400 million times. You're experienced as anybody. And you jump out of Joe Schmo's plane and you happen to hit a tree and it kills you. And the family goes, we're going to sue the plane because he, he dropped them out. Really? Really. What negligence was him dropping them out of a plane? The guy who jumped out of a plane, what, what negligence... He just drew up, you know, went up to 5,000 feet and he jumped out. What, what's wrong with that? There's no negligence there. Yeah, you could claim an assumption of the risk, but it doesn't matter. There's no negligence there. Okay? All right. So there has to be negligence on the other side first to even worry about assumption of risk. But that's why Texas just goes with comparative. They differentiate here from comparative opponents. Assumption of risk argue that it is in the public interest a system of comparative negligence rather than protect recovery, such as implied voluntary assumption of like when a fan gets hit by a foul ball during a baseball game. Okay. Fan gets hit by a baseball in a baseball game. What negligence was there by the batter? Hmm. I mean, he's doing what a reasonable batter does, swing at the ball. <laughs> now, the batter gets done batting, 
and he's mad. And he throws the bat into the stands and hits somebody in the head, which has happened before. Do you have a lawsuit? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because that guy, well, that's an, well, it's not an intentional tort. It's negligence. He intentionally threw the bat, but he didn't necessarily mean to hurt somebody. He just got mad and threw it. He was negligent. He didn't do what a reasonable person would have done. Okay? If they come back and say, well, you assumed the risk by getting in the stands, nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it. Nobody assumes that risk. Okay? All right. All right. Plaintiff can express a consent to the risk by agreeing. This is why when if you do bungee jumping, you do anything like that. Okay? Now, if something's wrong with the rope, if something's wrong with something, okay, you're not waiving their negligence. You're not saying, oh, if you negligently don't take care of your products, that's okay, and I die to my death. That's fine. I would never sign that agreement. If they say, you know the risk of bungee jumping, and you know that, you know, you could get hurt. I don't agree with that. But it can't be because of your negligence. Okay? What about when they fall trying to catch a fall ball? It's comparative negligence. It's comparative negligence. You know, a reasonable person wouldn't lean so far over a rail to fall over. They might lean over you know, now, here's a good one. I'll go one step farther. What happens if the rails are only a foot high and not three and a half feet high? Ah, maybe the stadium. Maybe the stadium owes some liability. Because that a reasonable person would expect that there's something there to catch them from falling to the next floor. That's a fair assumption. I handled the first lawsuit out of Minute Maid Park. Um, it was just built. It's, that's the Houston Astros play out of It is called Minute Maid Park back then. It was the first game they opened up. They didn't have, they, they were still doing some construction, and one of the things they hadn't finished, they hadn't put the anti-slip material on the steps. Okay? And sure enough, they, the contractor or whatever didn't get it done in time. And they had the first Astros game there or whatever. And so they wanted to get it going, and they played it. Well, the lady was walking down the steps, and as you can imagine, there was beer spilt or something on the steps. And, of course, cement, when it gets wet, pretty dang on slippery. So she goes flying down the steps. Ends up breaking her ankle pretty bad. Okay? Well, does she assume the risk of going to a ball game and falling down the steps? No. doesn't matter. Okay? Were the Astros, actually it was Houston Sports Authority, were they liable in putting, you know, the material down and doing that? It was in the plans. So they don't they knew for sure that, you know, they should have put it down. It just didn't get to it. Yeah. Did we settle that case? Yep. Okay. You can understand that. I mean exactly. Does the contractor ultimately pay? Absolutely. Because there's an indemnification clause. Yep. It was contractor's insurance, actually. But yeah, that's so that's what I'm saying. It's it's you, know, you have to look at all those factors. You know, is somebody negligent? Maybe not. And one reason, even if they are, then you can look to contrib, at least in the state of Texas. Assumption of the risk, yeah. It kind of comes into play, but it's it's couched as contrib. Okay. All right. Just remember, you can assign pretty much almost anything away. Negligence, not always. There's a lot. Of, there's some inroads on that that you cannot. Okay. Like when you go into surgery, you'll sign consent forms that you understand that general anesthesia can be very dangerous. You may die. You may have cardiac arrest, you may blah, 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 you know, they list 400 things, and they have to go over it with you and give you what they call informed consent and all that. Okay. But you need your right leg cut off. And you come out of surgery and they cut your left leg off. 
Uh, no. You didn't consent to them cutting off the wrong leg. That was not part of the agreement. I think that's pretty fair to say, <laughs> okay? Now, you would have died under a heart attack because of anesthesia and your heart gave out or whatever. Those are all risks. We all know that. And you have to sign off on that. But you don't agree for them to you know, screw that up in the surgery or leave an instrument in your chest, okay, or leave a sponge in there. You never agreed to that. Who? That's, that's nonsense. You can see where judges even go, wait a minute. So they're agreeing that anything you do, you're not liable for. Yeah, that's right, judge. I uh, know. They ain't going to fly. That's why I said you can agree to a lot of things, but there's certain things you can't. Okay, or they, they, it's just it, it's against policy of law. Okay, sure. Sponges are counted by two or three people now in every surgery. How many they use and how many they take out. Because they used to leave them in quite a bit. You don't hear about it too much anymore because they have literally two or three people that count them as they go in and two or three people as they come out. Okay. Uh, plaintiff can impliedly consent to the risk often uh, based on plaintiff's conduct, but only if the defendant offers an activity to the plaintiff without obligation. The activity carries certain unavoidable danger, and the plaintiff is aware of the risk, agrees to participate in the activity, considering the risk worthwhile. And I don't know if they sign a consent form or not, but I don't know if any of you all have seen uh, Cowboy Poker. They get four usually drunk people. That's a good point. You know, if you're drunk, can you consent legally? I don't think you can. So even if they did legally consent, I don't think they are consenting legally because they're, they're incapacitated to consent. <laughs> That'd be my argument. They get out there with these, they put four guys on a table, one of these plastic tables, plastic chairs, and they have to put their hands on the table. And I've seen this numerous times. It's funny as heck, as long as you're not the one out there. They do give them helmets, and they do give them, like, flak jackets. And then they let the bull out. And, of course, the bull goes, sometimes walks around before he hits them, but lots of times he doesn't just walk around. He charges them and blows them up like bowling pins. And the last person to have their hands on the table wins a whopping, the ones I've been at, $100. Yeah. And a free trip to the chiropractor, I guess. I don't know. Um, but it's hilarious that these guys do this. It's it's amazing. You sit and watch it, and every time you laugh, who's the idiot that's going to do that? And usually it's drunk people. Um, but, yeah, they say, well, we're going to sue you for what? How were we negligent? Well, you let the bull out. You knew we were going to let a bull out. Okay? What did we do unreasonable? Mm, don't know. So that's what I mean. So there's really, you know, implied consent. Yeah, but what did they do wrong anyhow, if, even if you argue that? So it's one of those things. It is funny if you've never seen it. Okay. What you can see, and I'm going through a bunch of different scenarios with you, is that there's inroads in a lot of these cases for the plaintiff, for the defendant, vice versa, you know, Plaintiff's got holes, defendant's got holes, plaintiff's got good claims, defendant's got good claims. So you can see different things, just the three or four scenarios I gave you. You start thinking, wow, yeah, what about this? And then, oh, yeah, what about the stadium? What about, oh, what about the contractor? What about, you? that's exactly right. That's where you want to start thinking. You want to start thinking who down this line maybe was unreasonable, plaintiff or defendant, okay? Or maybe a product. Maybe there's a defect in the vehicle. Okay? So start looking at all that stuff. When you interview people, your mind should be going 100 miles an hour of, well, what about this? What about that? And if you re remember the movie My Cousin Vinny, when he goes up to that guy and he says, ah, remember, I think he had a broken arm or something. He said, oh, injured, huh? Yeah. He's thinking, ah. Oh. In a house? Yeah. Ooh, he's thinking, ooh, good case. Your house? Yeah. Oh, crap. See? You know, he thought about that. Like, oh, uh, he went down those two or three questions and he found, ah, it's not that good a case. Now, there's more questions you might have asked. Like, was anybody at your house? Did somebody trip you? Did the contractor just put something in your house and the board was loose? Or what happened? How did you fall? In other words, look at the details. Even if you get hurt in your own house, that doesn't mean you're not, somebody else isn't liable. 
What if you had a contractor out there the day before that fixed your stair rail, and you went down the stairs and you grabbed the rail and it broke off and you fell down? Uh, yeah, that's a probably a good claim. Okay? So keep asking these questions. All right? And there may not be anything there. It may be a loser case, and that's fine. Okay. Knowledge of risk. Under ordinary circumstances, plaintiff will not be taken to assume any risk for which plaintiff has no knowledge. Plaintiff must not only know the facts which create danger, but must comprehend and appreciate the, basically the nature of the danger. Okay. Like I said, assumption of risk, not in the state of Texas, might be in a lot of other states, um, but I think more and more states have gone to just rolling it into contrib or comparative negligence. All right, defendant whose conduct would otherwise be negligent towards the plaintiff may escape liability if the harm was caused by the consent or fault of the plaintiff. Absolutely. The plaintiff's contrib could absolutely bar an action for negligence, but only in those jurisdictions that continue to use this principle, which the state of Texas does, long it's over 50%. The comparative negligence of the plaintiff diminishes his or her recovery in the many jurisdictions that enacted a comparative negligence law. That is true also. Okay. That's why we, like I said, we've kind of got the modified form. It's just ours is 50%, not like the example on here at 49%. Okay. Assumption of the risk may negate a plaintiff's claim if plaintiff appreciated the dangers associated with a particular type of activity. All right. Just because you assume the risk doesn't mean somebody else gets away because they're negligent or intentionally hurt you. Remember the hockey game? Okay. Yeah, hockey is one of the roughest sports. You don't think anybody that plays hockey doesn't know it's rough? Yeah, but not when a guy swings his stick and takes your eye out. That's not part of the game. So there's no assumption of risk there. Okay. Everybody good? Understand that? Like I said, these laws get, there's a lot of gray areas in these laws. Okay. So if you think we've covered everything in here about contrib or comparative, no. But this should give you an idea of what to look for and where to go. And if you need to research it, research it. But at least it gives you an idea of, who there's some liability in that plaintiff. Or if you're on the plaintiff side, you should be going, oh, crap, our guy was contrib. Man, they, we might get wiped out. You know, they might be over 50%. You know, Things that you got to think about on both sides, okay? Especially when you're interviewing the client and witnesses. Now, when you interview witnesses, and I talked about this a little bit, I think, in the beginning, don't tell them if they say, well, we think your client was liable and you represent the plaintiff. Don't say, yeah, I agree. He, you know, he did, do, he did some screwy stuff. Don't say anything like that because that is not a privileged conversation. So if the defendant interviews the witness and or takes their deposition or puts them on the stand at trial and said, did you ever talk to the plaintiff's count or, you know, anybody from plaintiffs? Oh, yeah, I talked to the paralegal. Oh, yeah, what would you talk about? Talked about this and that. Did they say anything about liability? Oh, yeah, they said their, their client's very liable. Really? That's really what you want on hand? You better crawl underneath that desk quick. Don't ever talk to a witness and tell them your weak signs. What's between you and your client and the attorney, that's different. Okay? Um, we can talk about that. If, if, the client, if the client has a hole in their roof, okay, there's mitigation of damages. That's a good point. And maybe the contractor or something, whatever, doesn't matter. Their fault, nobody's fault, you know, God's fault, lightning hits it, it just shingles wore out, whatever. Water's leaking in your house, okay? You have a duty to mitigate your damages. If somebody's liable, maybe the roofer didn't do a good job and you're going to sue them and you've got a $2,000 rug sitting under this hole, and it just starts dripping, and you're like, wow, I, I should move that rug, but ah, let the contractor pay for it. He's going to pay for it, damn him. Uh, no. No. They are not responsible. You have a duty to move that rug. 
You have a duty to put a bucket there or something. Okay? Mitigate your damages. If it's just a big rainstorm, nobody's fault. The shingle just got old. It starts leaking. But you want to recover under your insurance policy. Same thing. You've got that rug sitting there. Yeah, I want a new rug. I'm just going to let it soak it up. Who cares? Insurance is going to pay for it. If they find that out, they will deny that claim for that rug. Okay? You have a duty to mitigate your damages. Now, that can only go so far. You know, a hurricane comes in, blows your shingles off. Are you expected to get out there in a hurricane and put a tarp over your roof when winds are blowing 60 miles an hour? No. Absolutely not. Now, the next day when skies clear up, do you have an obligation to call your insurance company and tell them about it and maybe they can get out and cover the roof or you can get a tarp up there and cover it? Yes. In case another rainstorm. And, you know, maybe all the contractors are busy and you can't get on the roof, the insurance company can't get out there. Well, maybe three days later is as soon as you could do it. That's fine. What's a reasonable person can do? Okay? Good question, though. So, yes, you have a duty to mitigate the damages. Same thing in a car accident. They get in a car accident, okay, and the car accident blows out your, your window. You take it home, and you're like, dang it, it blew out my window. And you hear all big rainstorms coming, you're like, screw it. That was only damaged under your car than a little dent on your bumper, but it just happened to shatter your window. So now it rains all night, ruins your whole interior, you know. $10,000 worth of damage because the interior is all ruined and flooded. Really? You think that's part of the claim? Don't think so. You had a duty to mitigate those damages. Throw a tarp over it. Put it in a garage. Do something. Okay. Now, if it's not drivable and gets towed to a tow yard where you can't control it and it gets rained in, that's different. That's not what we're talking about. Okay. Employee fires you because you know information about him, the boss having a relationship with a coworker. Is that legal? Yep. State of Texas, you can get fired for anything. They can fire you because they don't like your shoes. Now, that does not mean, and we're getting a little bit off subject here, but that does not mean that you can't collect unemployment. Okay? Because they didn't fire you for cause. Now, Another step to that, they cannot fire you for, you know, race, religion, all that kind of stuff. If you are a protected class. Okay. Okay, even if you question, sorry, even if you have, like, it recorded, like, you know, like, you know, on recording, no, you're not going to get fired, no, you're okay. Um, he, can, he can fire you. Yeah. Yeah, you can go in front of 50 witnesses and say, you know, you know, I know you're sleeping with your secretary or whatever, blah, 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 blah. He says, yeah, so you're fired. Oh, well, you're fired. Is it morally right? No. It doesn't sound like the guy or the girl's morally anyhow, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> but, but no. Is it against the law in the state of Texas? No. Can no. you collect unemployment? Yes. Do you have a lawsuit? No. In California, you may. California is pretty pretty liberal on protecting employees, and I understand their employment system is pretty tight, so I don't know, but not in the state of Texas. Like I said, you can come in one day and wearing the wrong shoes. He says, I don't like those shoes. Well, what are you going to do? I'm going to fire you. You can't fire me because I don't like my shoes. Yeah, I can. You fire for whatever reason. Yeah, it's not at will. Whatever. It's an at will state, absolutely. Okay. Yep, yeah, Texas and that will. Okay. So, yeah. Like I said, they can't fire you usually for medical reasons, and they can't fire you usually, well, not usually, for a protected class, race, religion, gender, that kind of stuff. Okay. Now, there's different jobs that have different things, by the way. Government. It has a little more protection in their jobs because it's contract type stuff. Or if you sign an employment contract, you might get some, you know, severance or something. I don't know. But that's pretty much it. All right. 
We good on that? I'm sure, you got a lot of I think hopefully good information out of that chapter. Okay. Premise liability. All right, we'll go over this. This here again. There's gray areas because what you know what is this and what is that and what were the conditions of the premises and I mean who knows? There's so many different scenarios. You know, was it a dangerous condition or was it not? Well, that's a fact issue. Was this a dangerous condition? Mm, maybe. You know, if it's dynamite sitting there, yes. You know, a, a two-inch little hole in your grass, is that a dangerous condition? Probably not. Is a, you know, 40-foot hole that you dug and you didn't cover up dangerous? Yeah. You know, but what about in between? What about six-inch hole? What about a foot hole? What about a two-foot hole? I mean, so... You know, there's so many different scenarios. Okay? All right. We're going to talk about this, though. This can be some very complex law. Um, there's a lot of case law on it. There's a lot of just arguments on this type of law, premise liability. But what I want you to get out of the same thing as last one. Just know that it's out there. Know kind of what to look for. Know that you need to look a little deeper into the facts of the situation, see if you can identify those facts with maybe some case law out there to see if you've got a good case or not, you know, as close as possible. You know, slip and falls in grocery stores, Kroger versus Keech. I remember that case from law school. Had to use it a few times in my practice. I just know that case, Kroger versus Keech. It's a slip and fall case, okay, and, and Kroger, of course. So, you know, it's just one of those things. There's just laws out there and all this stuff, and there's gray areas. Okay. Very important, though, if, you do, if you've got a premise liability case. You know, what's a trespasser, invitee, licensee, and we're going to talk about those. All right. That in itself is a fact issue. Okay. All right. Talk about the role of nature conditions and the duty of landowners or holders. The duties of a landholder to all persons that enter the property, the liability of a landholder towards a trespasser, concept of a licensee in relation to liability, the liability of landowner toward an invitee, liability of landowner and tenant towards persons entering the property, and understand liability of landowners as sellers of real property. All right. A law protects the landowner's interest in the property. The law also says the landowner has responsibility to others on real property. Sure. To some extent, depends on who you are. You know, if I invite you over to my house and I've got cords or something laying all over the floor, well, if I have them all over the floor, you'll probably see them. I have a cord, you know, across a walkway and you don't see it because maybe the lights aren't on or whatever and you trip and fall, am I liable? Sure. I knew it was there, but you didn't know it was there. There's a good chance that I'm liable. Now, that's for a jury to determine if. Because my defense is, well, you should have looked. Did you look down? Did you watch out? That's what I'd be claiming. And their claim is, you shouldn't have put it there. You should have taped it down or something, you know. So that's what I mean. It's both ways. So who's going to win that? I don't know. What happens if the room is well lit? Should you have seen it? Yeah. Okay. You see the defenses and back and forth. There's so many fact issues that juries have to look at. It's crazy in these things. All right. This chapter views the landlord as a potential defendant whose liability depends upon the use of the land and the relationship between the use and the plaintiff. Land is known as real property, real estate. Personal property is everything else. Okay? I think everybody knows that. Premise refers to real property in all attached buildings, grounds, facilities, structures attached to the land. Okay? Barns, garages, houses, those are all premises. Landlord can either own or rent a property. This is important to know. A landowner is liable, of course, if they have possession and control of it. If they are renting it out to somebody, then the renter is liable. Landowner can be held liable in limited situations, like there's a danger that he didn't disclose or something like that. But otherwise, if he doesn't have control of the property, usually it's the renter. Okay. But you may sue both just to screen them out, see who really knew about it or didn't know about it. Depends on what it is. Depends who's got the deep pockets. Usually if the guy's renting out property, he's got the deeper pocket pockets for the landowner. Okay. 
If someone interferes with the use and enjoyment of the property, the landowner can sue that person for the tort of trespass. Okay, think about it. Somebody comes on your property, unwanted, you can usually sue them for the tort of trespass. If a landowner interferes with the neighbors or the public property and enjoyment of its real private landowner may uh, file for nuisance. Premise liability is liability that may arise for a land on a regarding the use of real property often for negligence. Landlord holder has breached the duty of care that resulted in an injury. Okay. Basically, if you don't do and you breach your duty, you're probably going to be held liable. This is no secret. Okay? All right. To certain people. Maybe not trespassers. And we're going to get there. Okay. Landholder will most likely discover any damage or dangers existing on the property. This is why the landowner or holder, which could be the renter, um, is liable. All right? Or can be liable. Think about it. They're on the property probably every day. They know the, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly about it. They most likely be liable. Landholders must exercise reasonable care and take into account the interests of other individuals potentially affected by that use. Here again, this isn't rocket science. You know, do you see something that's sticking out somewhere that could hurt somebody? You fix it. Because guess what? Somebody could get hurt. You know, you see it all the time. You're walking somewhere and all of a sudden you trip over something like, wow, they need to fix that. Somebody could get hurt. Absolutely. And usually once they're on notice, this is why it's not always the first accident that gets money. It's usually the second one in premise liability. Because there's usually a smoking gun. Like if somebody gets hurt on a property and they say, the owner goes, God, we didn't know about that. But then a month later somebody gets hurt and they, they in discovery say, we want to know about any problems you've ever had with this or complaints. And all of a sudden, you find out a month before they were put on notice to fix that because they tripped over it, too. That, that part of it's done. They have knowledge, so they're screwed on that. And they were told it was a dangerous condition because that other person tripped on it. It helped your case. That's why I said sometimes it's the second person that wins out on premise liabilities. All right, exception regarding natural conditions, which involves land and estate unaltered by people. Unaltered by people unaltered by people. Okay. There's a reason I'm saying that. Including the natural occurrence of trees and vegetation of kind along with rock and mineral formations. I have 100 acres and there's rocks out there and there's trees and there's everything out there. And you say, hey, can I just walk through your land? I really enjoy the beauty of it. And you say, sure. The guy's out there and a rock falls down on him or something. If I've never touched that rock or altered that formation of that rock, very good chance I'm not liable. Now, if I was out there stacking those rocks one way because I thought it would look cool to stack them one way and those rocks fell, different story. Okay. You know, if I own 500 acres of trees and you're walking through and a tree falls on you, am I liable? Uh, probably not. Probably not. Now, if I live in a lot and I know a tree is really dead, and I know any kind of windstorm, it's going to fall and hurt somebody. Maybe so. Okay. That's the difference. All right. Okay. Under the common law, landlord's duty to another and landlord's property depending on the status of that person in the eyes of the law. Entry upon land. We're going to talk about that what your status is in a little bit. Those who enter upon land are divided into three fixed categories, trespassers, licensees, and invitees, and they are subdivided, duty to each. They make out as a general pattern a rough sliding scale by the legal status of the visitor and the possessor of the land, more of an obligation of protection. The system has long been made legal writers and some of the quite unhappy because of its arbitrary and sometimes unreasonable character there's been 
some recent movement towards absolving this distinction, at least between invitees and licensees. And it's true. It, it's that's what I mean. So this law is it's so confusing and so up and down, and who's who and what's what. And, ah. Okay, but the traditional entrant classification scheme is well entrenched. Great majority of jurisdictions, so the categories must be considered one by one. Okay, let's get to the chase. Trespasser. Entered landowner's property without permission or privilege to be there. Duty owed, none, to such intruders. Okay? Landowner has no liability for injuries the trespasser suffers from being on land. I won't say never, because it can happen. Um, there's some laws out there that you cannot set booby traps on land, mainly to protect the public and uh, people like firefighters, policemen, or anything like, or emergency crews. Like, you cannot wire a shotgun to the door handle. So if anybody turns that door handle, the shotgun goes off. Okay? That can be a problem. Because what happens if a fireman needs to get in? Okay? But in general, yes, there's really no duty owed to trespassers, okay? Exceptions, most jurisdictions hold landowner to a degree of reasonable care for a frequent trespasser where a landowner engages in certain activity when a landowner discovers a trespasser on the property and children in the case of an attractive nuisance. Children are different. We're going to talk about that. If you know the trespasser is there and he comes across and you, you don't say anything to him, um, and tell them to stop coming, then, yeah, you probably got some liability there. Okay? All right, children. That's what I said. You can have four million scenarios. Well, I told him once. He didn't do it. He stopped for, you know, a year, and then he did it again. Well, how was I to know? Oh, God. You know, well, what? You know, so there's like, like I said, a million different scenarios in this stuff. But it's good to know categorize them, kind of what the duty is, is there inroads into that, is there case law in a similar situation, and what's what's our chance of winning, or if you're on the defense side, what's our chance of winning on the defense side and saying there is no duty or whatever, okay? All right, trespassing shows a little different, because there's a thing called an attractive nuisance. Um, best example I can give you on that is a pool, okay? There's a reason you need to have a fence around your pool. There's a reason the fence needs to be four feet high in most jurisdictions. There's a reason locks need to be on the fence. Okay? Why? Because children are attracted to pools. They want to go swim and they want to go look at the water, whatever it is. Now, if a kid climbs your fence, in Texas, usually we have like six-foot fences. Kid climbs your fence, goes swimming in your pool and drowns, chances are you're not liable. Okay? Now, if the kid walks in your backyard because you don't have a gate, you the gate broke and you didn't fix it, and a three-year-old or four-year-old kid in the neighborhood walks by and says, oh, there's a pool, and walks in and drowns, yeah, you got some problems even though technically he's a trespasser. All right, here's why. The landloader, landholder knows or has reason to know of a condition exists on the property which might cause children to trespass. Maybe it's a jungle gym, whatever, pool. Pool is the number one. That the condition involves an unreasonable risk of death or serious harm. Okay? Children would not appreciate the risk associated with that. They don't understand that if they fall and they could drown. Okay? The utility of the landowner of maintaining the condition and eliminating the danger are slight compared to the risk of harm. In other words, putting a gate with a lock. Okay? Is that $100 compared to a kid's life? Yeah. Landlord fails to exercise reasonable care to eliminate this danger, otherwise to protect the children. Okay. As you can see, this is why pools are an issue. This is why you see kids drown in apartment complex pools and the apartments get sued. Why? Because the gate lock was broke or something like that. 
This is why if you live in an apartment or ever lived in an apartment, you're like, why do they put a lock on this gate? Why do they put a self-closing gate? That's why. Number one, it's code using the city limits, but number two, it's for liability. <laughs> okay? All right. Licensees have permission or license to enter the property. This is basically your family, friends, guests, whatever, coming to your house. Okay? Duty owed, reasonable care. As long as the landowner was aware, the licensee's presence on the property knows of the danger. Remember I told you about the cord on the ground or whatever? Something, you know, whatever. Okay? You know about it. You know they're there. They slipped and fall. A reasonable person would have taped it down, ran it behind the couch, whatever. I don't know. We all know loose cords can trip people, and that's not, there again, rocket science. Got to remember, what's a jury going to say? Hmm, was that reasonable care? Probably not. You know, you mop the floors and didn't do anything, and you invite the neighbor and he slips and falls, yeah. Maybe the baluster is loose on the handrail, okay, and they slip and fall, grabbing the handrail, whatever. Person just walking down a normal set of steps falls down? No, chances are no. Unless your stairs are really weird, you know, and they're too steep or something, but even then they, they would see that. That's where you would say, you know, they they have a duty to look out to protect themselves, whatever. Okay. So they were contrib. Okay. All right, that's licensees. So we have trespassers, licensees. Those are your basic guests and all that kind of thing. Okay. Invitees. This often refers to visitors for the economic benefit of the landholder. This is your businesses. This is your grocery stores, that kind of stuff. Social guests are not invitees but licensees, yeah. Duty owed, reasonable care. So a landlord faces liability when failing to exercise reasonable care to protect an invitee regarding the condition which poses an unreasonable risk of harm to such invitee and that the invitee will not discover or realize the danger or condition or will fail to protect itself against it. Okay, what does that mean? That means if there's something there that a reasonable person would have fixed, or a reasonable owner would have fixed, that uh, it shouldn't hurt somebody. Okay. And they have to know about it. All right. This is Kroger versus Keach. For instance, if there is water on the floor in a grocery store and you walk in and slip, you're thinking, ah, they're liable. They should have mopped it up. They should have put, you know, Beware of wet floors, warning signs, you know, you see those cones and everything. Maybe. What happens if you slip because the person in front of you, kid, in the cart, spilled something on the floor? And you're walking 10 feet behind them and looking at the shelves or whatever, and you walk behind them, and all of a sudden you slip and fall. Okay. How is the grocery store know that that condition existed. They'd have to follow every customer around and look for slips all the way around the store. Now, let's give another scenario so they're not liable. That's one of the biggest problems in winning one of those lawsuits. There's the old grape thing. There's the old slip on the floor, water. Well, how you win them is if pictures were taken and there's looks like 20 shopping carts went through that water before your guy slipped. Oh, well, 20 shopping carts went through because we all know and we expect stores to walk their floors at least, especially grocery stores, you know, looking for things like that. They can't walk behind everybody, but they should walk them pretty regularly. All right, let's go to an easier one. That's a gray area. The freezer refrigeration system at the grocery store is leaking and it's dripping water out. Every once in a while the store will come by and mop it up and it's clean and then they walk away and all of a sudden somebody walks by and oh, slip on the floor. Did the store know? Absolutely. Did they safely protect against it? Nope. Okay. So you can see there again, God, there could be a million scenarios. Yep. All right, but this is where 
you have to look at what was reasonable. Did the store do what reasonable people would do in that situation? There again, also, you have a duty to watch out, the plaintiff does. The plaintiff just can't walk down the aisle, not looking at anything. They should watch where they're going. Now, there's people that have slipped in stores before, and because uh, they tripped over their own feet, you get the video and you're like, well, that person tripped over their own feet. How's a store liable for that? Tripping over rugs, carpets? Hmm? If it's a, a commercial grade mat, you know, in the, you see in the produce section or whatever, it's to stop people from slipping. Because sometimes it gets wet around there. But maybe they dragged their feet and buckled the rug and tripped over it. Or the person in front of you walking buckled the rug, rug or a kid was playing with the rug and buckled it, and all of a sudden you came behind them two seconds later and tripped. Chance that store is not liable. But what if the rug is defective and got torn, and it's been like that for a week, and you tripped and fell where the torn spot was in the rug? Yeah, maybe so. Yeah, it happens, okay? So you can see the different scenarios here. And that's why I said, uh, you know, we could sit here all night going through them. But just when you interview your client and, like I said, witnesses and stuff, and or get documents from the store, look for those things. Has anybody been hurt like in the store in that area or from a similar type situation? Anybody got hurt that day from that? Anybody else got hurt at all? You know? Any pictures taken, any this, whatever, okay? How did you fall? That kind of thing. Yeah, Jennifer. Um, that wasn't premises. When you said normally it's usually the second or third uh, plaintiff that usually gets paid, if that's the case, then can the first or second one come back um, because of that? No, because the reason I say the second or third one gets paid is because the first one put them on notice because they didn't have notice of the defect or the problem. They have, to, they have to have, they either knew or should have known. It's not that they knew. If they knew the water was there and just ignored it, well, that's an easy one. But should they have known? Okay? Should they have known that there was water spilling from here or to walk the floors? Grocery stores, you'll see people walking the floors pretty consistently because of this. And the reason I say the second one usually recovers is because if the first one walks up and tells them, hey, you got a spill on aisle five, and that's reported at five o'clock, and you walk by at 5.30 and slip on aisle five, hmm, you got a pretty good chance of getting some money. Now, if you walk by at five with three seconds, no, because they just got put on notice. They can't run over there in three seconds and fix it. Okay, that's why I said the first one's got to show that they knew or should have known. And I'm not saying you can't win on the first one because people do it, and I've settled cases on that. But it's tougher. If there's a defect or something going on, it's always better if somebody else got hurt first because they definitely, your notice is easy. You get their accident report and say, wait a minute, you know, an hour before this, the guy did the same thing, fell in the same spot, and you didn't fix it? No, we didn't get to it, really. So you're going to let the other people for an hour walk through this. Yeah, pretty much. Huh. That's why I say that. I'm not saying the first person can ever recover, because I had many cases of that. But I've also had cases where I'm like, crap, I know I need to show that the fact that this person slipped on a grape. Okay, i got to show that the store should have known this grape was there. Really? How am I going to prove that? Now, if there's a bunch of grapes on the floor and there's grocery cart, you know, they took a picture and there's grocery carts that have run over a bunch of them, ha-ha, the jury can determine. And the jury's going to say, well, yeah, there's 20 grapes on there and there's a bunch of carts that look like ran over them. So they've been there for a while. But that's tough to prove when you got, you know, one grape on the floor that a kid was eating out of the bag and he dropped one and you were walking up behind him and didn't see the grape and slipped on it. It's tough to prove the store's liable on that. And that you have to do. That's one of the elements. If you don't prove it, you get wiped out. And that's summary judgment. They'll ask, what's your evidence on it? Trust me, you've got to look real quick and creative on that. 
Okay. Premise cases are not easy to win. Okay. Now, in saying that, some can be. You walk in somebody's yard and there's a 40 foot hole uncovered and you fall in and get hurt seriously. Yeah. That's probably pretty easy to win. Okay. Especially when the neighbor dug the hole and didn't cover it up. And you're walking in the sidewalk that apparently no longer exists. And he didn't tell you that he's going to dig up the sidewalk because he had to dig his sewer up. Yeah, that's probably pretty win, pretty easy. You see where I'm getting at. Okay. Either a public invitee, a person who's on the property is a member of the public for a purpose in which the land is held open, a business visitor, a person around the property for a purpose that indirectly connects with business dealings with landholders. Okay. Basically, Postal carriers, community property inspectors, electricians, blah, blah, blah. Um, the fireman's rule that emergency service providers will be owed no duty of care, although most jurisdictions have banned this rule. Texas does not look at that. There is duties owed to the firemen and all that, especially, especially you cannot put traps and stuff like that. That is a no-no. Okay? You know, if you're dying in a fire in your bedroom, and the smoke has literally knocked you out, and you've got a cord laying across, and the fireman comes running in and trips on that cord, uh, chances are you're not liable. You know, what are you going to do, wake up from your coma and say, hey, watch for that cord, now save me? Yeah, you can't. I mean, how are you going to warn them? And secondly, maybe the cord was you are laying on a heating pad or something, I don't know, at night. You didn't expect anybody to come in there. So, you know, it's... Like I said, generally there's no rules, but you can't do, like I said, you can't do traps, you can't do booby traps and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Elimination of distinctions by statute, which reflects a consensus that no matter what person on the property, the landowner owes the person a duty of reasonable care. What they're saying is, just get away with all this stuff. Okay? Under common law. Of course, because these arbitrary classifications create many problems, when generating consistent rules, let's just go back to the reasonable care to everybody. Well, I don't have a problem with licensees and invitees. I have a problem with trespassers. Do I really have to protect against trespassers in my yard? I don't think so. I don't think that's right. Shouldn't be in the yard anyhow. Kids, I understand. You know, attractive nuisance, I understand that rule. But invitees or uh, licensees. I mean, the law is very, very, very similar anyhow, so it doesn't really matter. Okay. Lessor and leasee. Contract for only the use, but not the ownership. It's called a lease. Lessor owns the property, also known as the landlord. The leasee is the tenant who gains possessory uh, of the property. Okay. Possessory interest. Some call it rent, rent, rentor, rentee. Some call it lessor, lessee. Same thing. Both are land holders, not land owners. Under the common law, once the lessee occupies the premises, the lessor no longer has responsibility. Most times. Except to disclose a concealed dangerous condition on the property towards third persons as to dangerous conditions regarding premises lease for the public benefit, and regarding common areas under the lessor's control when having agreed to make repairs or when having agreed to make repairs at a reasonable time and didn't do them. Okay. Yeah, if the, if basically, if the landlord order, land owner knows about something, number one, he has a duty to notify the lessee, the renter, of that. Plus, if it's a dangerous condition, then and, and concealed, um, then you need to tell them about that too. Okay. But realistically, the lessee should be warning people or should take care of the situation, unless, like I like this says, the lessor has agreed to take care of the situation. Okay. Now, that does not negate if the lessee is aware of the condition of putting warning out to somebody. 
if he knows there's something out there, dangerous condition or something going on, he has a duty to do it too. Because he could be sued and the landowner could be sued. I mean, both of them could be sued. So don't think the lessee is off the hook just because the lessor has, you know, caused the issue or whatever. If the lessee knows about it and invites you onto your land, and if you say, oh, I want to go around back, say, yeah, go around back. And he knows there's a big hole there and he doesn't tell you, yeah, he could be held liable too. Okay? When selling real property, the vendor, the seller, transfers all responsibility for the property to the vendee or purchaser. You will see actually a lot more called the grant or and the grant e in real estate. Okay? The grant e is the or the grant or is the vendor and the grant e is the vendee or the purchaser. Okay. Under the common law doctrine of caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. The vendee or the purchaser has a duty to inspect the premise thoroughly so that a failure such contains a vendee's claim ignorance as a defense. Plaintiff subsequently gets injured on the premises. Basically what that says is that purchaser, you better inspect the property because you're put on basically let the buyer beware, caveat emptor. If you don't discover it, too bad. Now, if it's a hidden condition or something like that, that a reasonable inspection would not recover or something, that is different, of course. All right. You know, if there's something in the attic that the vendor, the property owner, knows about, maybe there's loose boards holding the rafters or something, and it's kind of concealed because of all the insulation, and you know that, and the purchaser buys the property and the roof caves in three weeks later, uh, yeah, trust me, the purchaser or the seller has a big problem. Okay? There again, four million fact scenarios out there. Just got to look at it. Okay? Most jurisdictions have tempered this doctrine such that a vendor conceals or fails to disclose any condition which involves unreasonable risk to anyone in land includes if the vendee if the vendee does not know or have reason to know of the condition and the vendor knows or should know of the condition, realizes the risk involved and has reason to believe that they will not discover the condition or realize the risk until the vendee discovers it and has reasonable opportunity to affect the precautions against the condition. Okay. That's just what I said in a nutshell. The seller knows about it and it's concealed and basically he knows there's risk involved. They need to reveal it. You're not going to get away with, you know, caveat emptor. Oh, well, too bad. You didn't do a thorough enough inspection. Could have. Just depends on the facts. But, yeah. If it's if it's pretty concealed, chances are the owner's going to be liable. Now, the owner may not know. The owner may not know about loose boards in the ceiling either underneath the insulation. I mean, who goes looking under the insulation all the time? So nobody may be liable. Okay? Just time and, you know, the home's 100 years old. Who knows? All right, summary. Real property involves land and everything on it. Personal property involves everything else. Landowner, I'm sorry, landholder could own the, own the land, own the land? Own the land or rent the use of the land as a tenant and a possessor. Questions of liability for injuries on the premises traditionally focused on those relationships, or three relationships, between landholder and the person who suffered the injury. Trespassers, virtually no protection. Licensees, receive protection from landowner's duty, reasonable care, but only if landowner knew of the license presence on the premises. Invitees, receive the greatest protection since the landowner owed them a duty of reasonable care straight out. Why? Because he gets invitees, he's inviting people in. The modern trend has been to require that the landholder have the same standard duty of reasonable care to all. I don't have a problem, like I said, with licensees and invitees. I think trespass is a little different. Duty of care may also rise regarding lessors and lessees and vendors and vendees or grantors and grantees. Now that we got all the legalese out, any questions? <laughs> There's a lot here, okay? And I know we went through it, and you're like, well, I don't really... 
If you understand that there's three categories, and I'll say this again, and that you can put them in one of those categories, and you see the situation, other than trespassers, look for reasonable care. And if you think, well, no, that landholder, renter, or owner, they didn't really do anything wrong, then you're probably okay. Okay? I mean, that's where you got to look. So just realize that. And if you get in a gray area, I've already talked to you about invitees, business invitees, because that's normally where this stuff happens is businesses. Why? Because people like to see businesses. I had one case where it involved the land. Oh, uh, let's see. There's only, I think there's only one case I ever tried that involved a land or a home owner where a kid got hurt. What happened was this boy was over at this other boy's house, and they were, you know, running through the house or whatever. And the people had moved their dining room table out from underneath the chandelier. You see this, where this is going. And the kids come running around the corner, and the second kid who doesn't live there, um, the first kid, of course, running through, he, he lived there, so he knew the table wasn't there in the chandelier. The second kid runs around the corner and smacks his head on the chandelier. Thinking, okay, how hard could that be hurt? Yeah, he wasn't that badly hurt on his head. He falls down, and a piece of the glass from the chandelier, this is crazy, pierces his leg and basically cuts a nerve. And this kid gets what they call drop foot. Okay, he drags his foot. And three, four years later, he's still dragging his foot. Okay? So, of course, we wanted some decent money on it. They didn't want to pay it. Their argument was he should have seen it. You know, it was open and obvious. Not a bad argument. I knew it was going to be a tough case. And sure enough, went to trial, and the jury basically found uh, by percentage that he contributed to the negligence by more than, I don't remember what it was, but it was more than 50%. I think it was like 60-40. The, the homeowners should have warned, should have had the table under there or something to protect people, but that was 40% of it. The kid was 60% for not basically looking ahead and watching out for it. But I will tell you, and I use this example, but the jury didn't buy it, of course, because otherwise I would have run the case. I've walked through houses where they didn't have tables, and I've walked into chandeliers, and I kind of, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I'm an adult. It just catches you because you don't think the chandelier is supposed to be hanging down in the middle of a room. So, yeah, so that's what it was. But that's, you know, that's how the, the cookie crumbles sometimes, like I said. You know, you've got to look at these things, and sometimes you have to try them, and you take your risk, and you think, well, you know, kids, you know, they were looking out, but, you know, kids are running, got their head down, and, you know, I mean, is it unreasonable for a kid to be running through a house? No. I don't think so. But the big thing is they should have, you should have saw the chandelier, maybe. And apparently they thought 60% were, or 55, I don't remember what it was, but. It wasn't like a ninety ten or anything like that. It was it was pretty close, but but they would have given him his damages. I think I was asking for I don't know a couple hundred thousand dollars or something or one hundred fifty because his medical was pretty expensive. I think he had like fifty thousand in medical or something like that because he was put in the hospital and everything. They tried to do surgery on that nerve, just couldn't. They fixed some of it, they just couldn't get it all right. So dog bites depends. Depends on dog bites. I've handled those cases. Um, dog bites against little girls is usually a winner. Uh, dog bites against boys is usually can be a winner. Um, it depends on the damages and if the kids were antagonizing the dog. <laughs> little girls usually don't antagonize a dog, and when they get bit, they get more money because little girls shouldn't have scars on their arms or their legs or their face. Little boys, they cut up their legs and get scars everywhere. And little boys are known for antagonizing dogs. So now you can see my point. Um, but I've handled them. Uh, the last one I handled, it was a kid who uh, basically went to the 
second day of school, kindergarten. So he's just starting school. Mom takes him out to the first day. Grandpa takes the son out, or takes his grandkids out, to his grandkids, and takes the dog with him. Well, the dog on the first day was kind of barking at the kids and growling a little bit. And instead of Grandpa leaving dog home on the second day, brings him back, or leaving him home, yeah, on the second day, brings him back. Well, my kids just stand in line, according to the witnesses, and basically turns around to, to the dog, and the dog just lunges at him, bites him right in, the, right in the mouth, right in the lip, tore his lip, pretty pretty open. I mean, they had to go and do surgery, of course, and actually the, the uh, plastic surgeon did a real nice job on him. But, of course, the kid didn't go to school the rest of the week, so you got this kid who's in his first time ever going to school, you know, traumatized. I mean, he really is. Um, so it was it was a a decent case. You know, it wasn't a multi million dollar case, wasn't even a six figure case. Um, but it settled for decent money and the case, you know, everybody goes, We gotta have the first bite rule. Well that's not necessarily true. What we were able to prove is that this dog um, had barked at the kids before, growled at them the day before and they still brought him out. Huge mistake. Um, you know, so they paid us money. What was funny is, I don't remember the lady's name, but she was on, she was on uh, the, the mom, the, the owner of the dog, whose dad, the grandfather that was out there, that we sued, um, we sued her and the dad, the granddad. She was on the Survivor Series. I don't remember, like two years before that or something. I didn't know who she was, but kind of interesting. Why sue the mom? Um, number one, the insurance policy for the house was in her name. <laughs> and she was the owner of the dog. And she should have told the dad, because the dog apparently would chase the kids every once in a while if he got loose. So she was aware that the dog, you know, now never bit any of the kids, but would chase them down and stuff. So she was aware of it, and she should have told, my argument was that she should have told the grandfather, her dad, you know, not to take the dog around the kids. He doesn't, you know, I don't like the kids, but he's he doesn't handle kids real well. Yeah. So. So the repercussions for that, by the way, are huge. She had to install a 10-foot fence after that from the normal 6-foot fence, put warning signs on the fence, and have a million-dollar policy on that dog. So if he bit anybody. Yeah. If the dog's ever bit anybody before, yeah, your chances are pretty good that you're going to win. You know, like I said, the second person <laughs> sometimes comes out better than the first person. Okay? You know, Texas in general, yes, is the first bite rule, but that that doesn't mean that you can't win it. If you can show tendencies of the dog's nature. And this was a, believe it or not, a golden retriever. Normally very good dogs. I mean, I'm, I'm a dog lover and normally very good dogs, but this one just didn't like the kids for some reason. So, you know, pit bulls, uh, it, it, you know, you may not know this, but most insurance policies, homeowners insurance policies now, will not cover you if you own, well, for dog bites at least, if you own a Rottweiler, pit bull, a German Shepherd, I don't know if German Shepherd's in there, um, Doberman, yeah. They won't cover the insurance, so could be a problem. Realistically, my theory is if you've got a dog that bites, don't don't own them. Don't don't uh, you know? I just why put yourself at that risk? People all the time do it. And I want a dog to protect the house. Really, you can have a dog bark at people all you want. Now, if they come in your house, th there's there brings up a point. You know, if a burglar comes in the house and the dog bites them. There's not going to be any liability there. Not going to be any liability. 
I think even there's no liability, probably or very limited liability, if it, you know if you're getting attacked by somebody or a burglar is trying to get in the house and you let your dog on them. I don't think there's any liability there either because it's basically self-defense and you're using your dog as a, I guess, as a weapon. Now, you better make sure. You better not make sure it's a neighbor kid knocking on the door and you open the door and the dog jumps on him and bites him. That could be a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see, you know, you just gotta, you, you gotta use reason in all this stuff. And um, you, you'll, you'll see after a while, ooh, this is a good case, man, or this one's got holes in it because of this, this, and that. And it just takes time, okay? All right, any questions, concerns? I tried to give you a lot of examples tonight because there's so many different scenarios out there on this stuff. Um, so, you know, the, hopefully that will give you some, I guess, ammunition to use in your questions and stuff when you're questioning witnesses or clients or whatever to see if it's a good case. Because these are going to be questions that the attorney you're working for is he's going to say, well, did you ask him this? Did you ask him that? And, of course, you're not going to know everything. But over time, like I said, you'll, you'll know what questions ask more and more whether it's a premise liability or whether it's an auto accident case or whatever. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, anything, questions? Okay. Don't forget, please do this question. I, I would love to give everybody 50 out of 50 on every one of those or 46 or 48 out of 50. You know, so turn them in early. You know, give me give me something to work with, okay? On those, because you know the other stuff, the AI the assignments, you, know, you can hit or miss. But like I said, there's very rarely right or wrong answers on the discussion. And I've seen, like I said, just in this class alone, I've seen people take one side and people take the other side. Fine, perfect. Nothing wrong with that. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, that's it for tonight, and. Hopefully, you all have a good rest of the week and weekend. And uh, go watch some football if it's still on, I guess, or baseball or whatever's on. All right. Take care.